Peter Gammons joins us here on the Rich Eisen Show. How are you, Peter? I'm doing great, Rich. I just I, I just got back last night from Cooperstown and the Baseball Hall of Fame, and that is in a lot of ways it's my favorite weekend of the entire year. And what you were talking about, the guys realizing it for the day after the uh, induction ceremonies, I always do a forum uh, for the hall with the inductees, and it's actually the best time because they're. They're really relaxed. It's all over. You know, it's the next morning, and they have so much fun talking and swapping stories. But it was really interesting. What really struck them was after the ceremony, when they hang, when they go in and they hang the plaques up on the wall, they all, one by one, they all go to see their plaques up on the wall. And that's the moment when all of a sudden um, they realize. Tim Rainson said to me, too, I mean, I just woke up today, this is the first day of my life where I've woken up and said, I'm a Hall of Famer. Hmm. And he said that just it, it's such an incredible dream. And, and uh, players are so humble. And I remember years ago, Tom Seaver, um, who was always has been reverent of the Baseball Hall of Fame, said to me, you know, the, the way to approach this and the way people feel and bond is that we are members of the most exclusive club in America. That's from a baseball player's eyes. But still, he said, you can't buy your way in. You can't be born into it. It's all about merit and achievement. And I think that that's what really hits athletes when they go, go into their sports hall of fame is, you know, this is not political. It's not about money. It's not, you know, uh, it's, it's all entirely about what I did in terms of merit and achievement. Well, a man who re- received the J.G. Taylor Spink Award for Outstanding Baseball Writing, uh, Peter Gammons here uh, on the Rich Eisen Show. So let's talk about, and uh, well put about Cooperstown. I, I just love uh, my a couple of ceremonies I was able to cover for ESPN up there in Cooperstown, New York. That was incredible, and everybody should go stop by the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum up there. Um, so let's let's talk about what didn't go down yesterday, Peter? Why why didn't Zach Britton get moved yesterday? They just didn't get very much offered. I mean, I was told. I think what didn't happen, the most important thing, was that Houston didn't do anything. I mean, hmm. learning how that's fine, but I mean, we don't know if he could pitch three out of four days out of the bullpen and pitch without warming up for 20 minutes. Probably not. So, um, but Houston, um, Houston made no effort, really. They, they have a line of seven or eight young players in their organization, um, two of whom I think would be considered prime guys, and they just won't trade. And they're, they're offered to the Orioles. The Orioles were, felt they were insulted by it. Hmm. And I, I know the Mets felt the same way about, um, you know, when they came to, that, to them about um, – uh, about a reliever or two. I mean, it, I think it was it was kind of stunning. I mean, prospects are great, and I understand Forrest Whitley and I understand um, the, the young outfielder, but I don't understand if a guy is your seventh or eighth best prospect and you have a chance to win. You may not have another chance to win like this, um, and I, I think sometimes you have to take that gamble. I know they're worried. They're very worried that. Jose Altuve will not be a long-term Astro. That he's still got Scott Boris as an agent, and he's probably going to leave. They think that there's still a hangover, a lot of bitterness from George Springer from when he first came up, and they tried to send him to the minor leagues if he wouldn't uh, wouldn't sign a long-term contract. And there were a lot of hard feelings that they're afraid they're going to lose two of their best players in the next three years. So they they want to hold on to all their prospects, but. You know, what happens if a couple of guys get hurt? I mean, right now I'm already worried about Lance McCullers. I mean, when's this guy going to pitch 150 innings in the big leagues? Uh, I'm not sure it's ever going to happen. So I, I think they had to go out and get somebody, and they didn't do it. I think that was sort of the, the conversation everyone in the game had. Yes, wow, look, you know, look what, what the Dodgers did. That was a great story. Look what the Yankees did in getting Sonny Gray. That was a big story. Um and they were, you know, I, but then you turn around and you look at the the Astros who are the best record in the American League, but have some injury questions, and their pitching staff has issues. Um, I, it, I think that was the most stunning thing, 
And I, what I think has happened now, as Cleveland is getting better and better as they go along, and the Yankees clearly with the bullpen deals they made with the White Sox and then adding Sonny Gray. Um, and even the Red Sox, Addison Reed is going to be a huge pickup for the Red Sox because he finally gives them a really reliable eighth-inning guy uh, to get to Kimball, which they have not had. So I, I look and I say, if those are going to be the four teams in the American League playoffs, um, that I presume, of course, the Red Sox beat Kansas City in the, in the uh, wild card. But I'm, I'm just sort of rolling here. But, but um, where are the Astros going to be? Could they end up? Winning 105 games and getting knocked out in the first in the first round they play. Wow! I, I hate to see that happen, but there are issues with that pitching staff. And uh, it, I mean, it is, uh, it, is a me, fa- it is a fascinating really, point that you make there, Peter, about about the Astros and how you know and how a team that could just be on a roll suddenly doesn't look as aggressive as they need to be in a moment like this, and we, we will see how it plays out in August. And I'm just keen to see that, you know, no, the J.D. Martinez move for Arizona and LaCroix for the Rockies, I think are being overlooked just because we assume that they're, these teams are just going to be cannon fodder for the Dodgers in a divisional series. Um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what you make of the, Card- the, uh, the Diamondbacks and the Rockies' chances here with the Dodgers sitting well, right up in front of them. I, I worry a little bit about the youth in the Colorado pitching staff. But they have great stuff, and they really have, in terms of the positional players that play every day, I think they're the best team nationally. And so, I mean, they're very dangerous. And, I I mean, you go up against Arizona, um, even if Clayton Kershaw is healthy, first game, Zach Greinke can beat, can beat anybody. And the way some of their – if Robbie Ray can be healthy, and that was a terrible blow he took to the head, but – if he's healthy and, and uh, um, they, may, you know, they're they're capable. By by the time they get to the playoffs, um, they'll have uh, they should have Owings and uh, Ahmed back, and they should be a, their team should be whole, which they haven't been for two months. So they're they're an intriguing team. I I love that that the National League playoff potential. I think the Dodgers are going to be really good. They're so deep, it's ridiculous. Now they're deeper, um, now, and now they're deeper, Peter. I mean, I'm I'm wondering, what do you think about about the way Dave Roberts is going to set up pitching now that he has the ability to make sure Kershaw pitches on full complement of rest uh, in a five game series? I'd want to start Kershaw because you're definitely going to get two starts out of him in a one and five. But in a in a seven game series, will there be a temptation to start him in game three? Maybe put Darvish and, and Wood out there first, put Kershaw on the road uh, in a game three and save him for a game seven. Is that a what do you what do you think they, they're thinking right now? If he's healthy, I think the guy that will be after Kershaw, the number one guy is Rich Hill. People just don't hit it, and uh, hmm. the experience. I mean, because you can get five innings and then go to that bullpen. And by the way. I love Sid Grani. I mean, I think their bullpen now is so much deeper. Plus, um, you know, it's uh, Walker Buehler will be in there for an inning uh, in almost every night, I think, come the playoffs. And uh, they're really good. And they, they, their bench is so deep. I mean, people talk about, well, they're vulnerable left-handed pitching. Well, they lead the major leagues in home runs and OPS against left-handed pitching. I guess they, Chris Taylor and all those guys uh, – I've kind of changed that team. They're really interesting. But, you know, if you end up playing Washington, for instance, you just don't know if Strasburg's back. I mean, Scherzer, Strasburg, um, as we saw last night with Gio Gonzalez, on any given night, he can be almost unhittable. So, I mean, there's a lot. And I think the Cubs, by that time, will be will be very, very good. I, I think that has a chance to be uh, – a really great group of, of four or five teams. I, I really believe that. And uh, um, I mean, I don't mean to be talking about the postseason too early, but I think hey. it, it, you start thinking about how it lines up. Yep. I mean, that's why I wonder. This, sometime this month, he may have already gone on, but Justin Berlander is going to go on waivers. Now, Tigers kind of need to get rid of that money. 
but they can't ask for prospects now. Um, they either keep the, eat, they pay the rest of the contract, or they get, if you can get Justin Verlander at thirty million dollars a year um, for three years and not give up a prospect, I mean, if you're a good team, I would be at the Cubs, which I don't think they would, but uh, if you're the Nationals, if you're uh, Houston, you're going to be awfully tempted to do that. I, I think it's a fascinating uh, scenario as far as uh, – because um, there, there have been you know, waiver deals after the trading deadline. I mean, David Cohn won the World Series for the Blue Jays in 92. He was a, a, an August 30th mm. uh, waiver deal. Don Sutton in 1982, not to go too far back in history, but, um, I mean, the, the Brewers, Steve Vukovic, who won the Cy Young Award, got hurt in September, was out for the rest of the year. They got Don Sutton on waivers and went to the seventh game of the World Series. Mm. So we still may see something that's, uh, that gets a little interesting here. La- that said, Peter, last one for you. Um, barring something shocking like that happening in, in August with Verlander maybe being picked up on waivers by somebody uh, in the hunt, now that we are through the uh, trade deadline, who do you think makes the World Series in 2017? I think it will be the Dodgers. Uh, I do think they'll make it because uh, I do believe that Kershaw will come back. And the layoff may have actually helped him just because he's pitched, he pitched so many innings. He's so intense. I think sometimes he would never admit it, but I think he is worn down a little bit by the time he gets to October. I, I want to see him healthy and strong. And I'll stick to my preseason prediction, and I still stick to the Cleveland Indians being in the World Series, although – I'm going to be really fascinated to watch the Yankees because I think one to eleven, they may have, they may end up with pretty close to the best pitching in the American League. It's amazing, it is amazing. Peter, thanks for the time. Really appreciate it. Rich, thanks so much. Always love it. That's Peter Gammon. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on radio stations across the country and audience. If you like that video, be sure to download our app, and I'll be sure to move Week 6 games to Saturday for that wedding you have to go to.